So hello, welcome to the video and welcome to, well, the palm trees behind me might give it away, but I'll reveal where I am in a moment. And today I'm flying on Qatar Airways in business class. Now Qatar has a few different versions of its business class. And today I'm flying in what is recognized to be their best, which is their Q-Suites product. Indeed, many of my esteemed colleagues will say it is the best business class product anywhere in the world. Now I've flown with Qatar in their Q suites a couple of times before, but only ever from Doha to Southeast Asia, which is a six or seven hour flight, still long haul, but it's not long enough to completely understand the food and beverage offering and to completely enjoy the sleep offering, both of which are pretty good on a Q suite. And I took both of those flights before I had a channel and videoed everything. So I've been looking for some time to find a longer Q suite flight so I can really try out the experience. I talk about it a little bit in this video here because I did have a couple of reservations about their offering based on those two experiences that I had. But with the pandemic, it's been very difficult to find flights. But a couple of months ago, Qatar announced that they were converting their frequent flyer currency to Avios, which is the scheme used by British Airways. I talked about that in this video here. And what that means is that it is now very easy to spend British Airways Avios on Qatar. So ladies and gentlemen, I went to work and I was able to make a redemption booking on Qatar for a very long Q-Suite flight. Indeed, it's actually the longest Q-Suite flight that Qatar currently offers and I believe it is the longest Q-Suite flight they have ever offered, although I am prepared to be corrected in the comments below. They used to fly down to Auckland, which is a longer flight than the one I'm taking today, but because, as you'll see, the Q-Suite product is quite heavy, they were never able to fly to Auckland with a Q-Suite equipped plane because none of their planes could go that far. And because they haven't yet resumed flights to Auckland following the you-know-what, not only is this Qatar's longest Q-suite flight, it is actually Qatar's longest flight out of any that they currently operate. And that flight goes from here in Los Angeles, 15 and a half hours, about eight and a bit thousand miles, to Doha. So if you would like to see what the Qatar Q-suite product is like on their longest ever flight, and you'd like to see how terrible I look when I get off the end of it, stick around. Hi, I'm Matt. Over the last 25 years, I've traveled a lot. I've lived in five countries on four continents. I've flown over 1.3 million miles. I've visited over 100 countries, every American state, but I'm nowhere near done. So hit subscribe to see where I go next and perhaps get some inspiration for your next trip. I doubt that Los Angeles International Airport is anyone's favourite airport. Building work is going on right now which seems to snarl up the flow of traffic so it was quite a battle to make it all the way round to the Tom Bradley International Terminal. This was midday on a Sunday and it was really busy inside the terminal as well. You'll notice a lot of people wearing masks. I don't believe they were compulsory and no one shouted at me for not wearing one, but of all the places I visited on this trip, California was the one where mask wearing was still most significant. Qatar connects people in Doha to dozens of destinations, so check-in was quite slow as there were lots of different paperwork requirements to check. I was asked to prove my vaccine status, which I don't believe was necessary, certainly not to enter the UK, and I understood there to be no restrictions on transiting Doha these days, but it only took a second and it was no big deal. Check-in staff have a terrible job to do, and I wasn't inclined to argue and make a scene. Nevertheless, it still took almost five minutes to complete check-in. He directed me to the fast track security line, which turned out to be only for those with TSA pre-clearance. It was a bit confusing to be honest and I couldn't see another fast track queue so I ended up in the regular security line. The security process had been extended to the lower level of the terminal to spread things out and even though the line looked daunting it moved really quickly and I was probably through in less than 20 minutes. And we got to see a rather tired looking doggy march up and down sniffing for something or other. The international terminal opens out and gets significantly more attractive past security. Retailers won't pay the big rents unless the space around them is pleasant. I spent a bit of time in duty-free shops on this trip with a video in mind on the subject, so look out for that. Hey, why not subscribe to the channel and ding the little bell so YouTube will notify you when my videos are released. 
only one real lounge option today, the One World Business Lounge, which is run by Qantas. I say one, but you can actually walk between terminals once you're airside, so I could have walked around to the Superior American Airlines flagship lounge in Terminal 4 if I'd wanted, but I was happy to stick with a Qantas Business Lounge, which I think is actually quite good. Qantas is yet to reopen its first class lounge, although that should happen soon. Something to bear in mind if you're transiting LAX, as you can get to it from the other terminals if you're travelling domestically on American Airlines. I enjoyed a gin and tonic at the bar, although I didn't eat anything. I had a big brunch, something which will feature in a future video, and I was looking forward to the catering on the plane, so abstained. Not an overwhelming food offering in the lounge, but you wouldn't stay hungry if you arrived that way. The check-in chappy had warned that it would be a remote gate which was a decent hike away from the lounge, so I set off with plenty of time to spare, and he was right. Bus gates are always a bit of a pain. In my experience, Qatar has been good at managing premium customers when buses have been required, but I suspect bus strategies are more airport-led, so at LAX we were all crammed onto a bus for the lengthy drive to the remote stands. Quite a few international airlines were operating from here. A bit of a pain not to be boarding directly from the terminal, but I think it was handled about as well as it could have been. Up a long and winding ramp towards the plane, a two and a half year old Airbus A350-1000 series. There had been a few announcements saying masks were required, but there was no enforcement of it at any point in the flight. And on to the plane, my home for what would turn out to be almost an entire day. Left turn into the larger of the two Q-suite cabins. A smaller two-row cabin is located behind door two. No escort to the seat, but a pleasant welcome, and it's pretty easy to work out where to go. The cabin certainly doesn't look like a typical business class cabin, and the seat doesn't look like a typical business class seat. A pre-departure glass of champagne was quickly offered. Laurent Perrier, a non-vintage brute. And a packaged cold towel, not quite as premium as an unpackaged cold towel, but very welcome nevertheless. The champagne was extremely refreshing, as was the towel, and here's footage of me using it. How attractive, just in case anyone doesn't know how to use a towel. So the seat, and there's quite a lot to cover. Beside you is a decent sized storage bin, which comes equipped with a bottle of water and your headphones. It looks ideal for storing your shoes, but if you wear size 11 boots like these, they don't both fit. I managed to get one in, and the other went quite comfortably under the housing in front of you. The entire bin moves up and down to be appropriate to both seat and bed configurations. No real storage beyond this bin though, but you can fit a lot into it, even when there's already a shoe in there. Moving around the seat and in front of you is an open shelf where the menus are presented. You can store more stuff here, although it may slide around in turbulence. I'll talk more about the menus later and I'll share them at the end of the video. Above this is another shelf on which you'll find the diptyque amenity box, not a bag on this occasion, as well as a hygiene kit and bedding. In front of you is the inevitable business class foot cubby. More on this later, but as good as the Q-suites are, it's still business class and there's still a foot cubby to navigate. Above this is a table which sticks out a bit in its retracted position and the large high quality screen. The table doesn't quite interfere with your knees when you sit back and relax, but it's close. I'm six foot four, so as you can see, my feet are a little constrained by the foot cubby, particularly when I've got my shoes on. The seat controls are arrayed in front of you, a power socket and USB port, headphone jack, and perhaps oddly, a credit card reader. The TV remote is also stored here, which pops out for convenience. The design of these seats makes all of the controls easy to find and use. Two more USB ports can be found under the TV screen. The table unlatches from below. Tricky the first time, but you get the hang of it. It's substantial, which is perhaps why it doesn't retract completely into the housing before you. It folds out and fills the entire area in front of you. A very substantial surface if you want to work during the flight. 
if you drop the storage bin beside you, it is possible to wriggle out of the seat with the table deployed. But a key feature of the seat is the door, which is nicely balanced and easy to operate. With the door open, you do get a pretty direct view of anyone in the suite across the aisle, although that seat was empty on my flight. When seated, the closed door does feel like it cocoons you in and gives a great sense of privacy, although for some people that cocooning might feel a little claustrophobic. And the wall that the doors create is only around four feet high, so the sense of privacy is a little illusory as you can easily look in as you walk past. I closed the door when I slept, but kept it open for most of the rest of the flight, as I quite like having a sense of what's going on in the cabin, and I feel the crew can anticipate your needs better if they can easily see what is going on. You can also see that Qatar has opted not to have storage bins down the centre of the cabin. That really opens up the space, even if it puts a little more pressure on the bins over the window seats. There are overhead air vents, but I have no idea how you reach them from the middle seat. The amenity kit was already on the seat when I boarded, so unless they'd done some homework, it was a unisex kit. As usual, a one-handed examination was not possible, but I changed strategy, and here's what was in it. Three assorted lotions, plus a cologne slash perfume spray, which makes me question whether it actually was a unisex kit, as it was quite a male scent. An eye mask, nose plugs, and socks. All good quality stuff. And a sleep suit was also delivered. A two-tone affair with a grey top and navy bottoms. Very comfortable to wear, although all airline PJs tend to be a little too warm for a comfortable sleep in cabins which are kept pretty warm. Good quality though. Qatar has invested in external cameras accessible through the entertainment system. It's very nice to be able to see what's going on outside, particularly if you take a middle seat without a window. I didn't really film the entertainment options, but the Oryx One system is very good with an extensive range of films and TV shows. We pushed back about 40 minutes late. An explanation wasn't really given for this, and throughout the flight the level of communication from the cockpit was poor, particularly in light of what was about to happen. During the delay on the ground, the crew had taken my food and drink orders for the entire flight. The crew said they were doing this so they could reserve my choice of meal for me, which made sense and sounded good, although I struggled a little to anticipate what I might want for breakfast in 12 hours time. And after a long taxi all the way back to the other end of the airport, we took off into a beautiful Californian afternoon. So, Doha to Auckland is just over 9,000 miles, but none of Qatar's planes that had that range were equipped with Q-suites. Sydney is now Qatar's furthest destination in Australasia at 7,700 miles, but LAX is an 8,300 mile flight. As Sao Paulo is about 1,000 miles closer to Doha, LAX is currently Qatar's longest flight, and I believe the longest flight ever serviced by a Q-suite. The quirks of a spherical Earth mean that Houston is actually the third longest flight currently. Remember, maps lie to you. This 15 and a half hour flight started by heading out over the sea away from Doha before turning to the north towards the Hudson's Bay. The up and down configuration of the window seats means that the seats closest to the window face backwards, but those are the ones you want as the forward facing seats are closer to the aisle. Flying backwards feels odd for the first 20 seconds of takeoff and the last 20 seconds of the landing, but for 99.9% .9 of the flight you really don't notice. Talking about seat configurations and the central bank of seats merits some analysis. The two central seats in each row are either shoulder to shoulder or are set apart, something to bear in mind if travelling with someone you like. And pairs of rows can be opened up to create a four seat block for a larger group travelling together. Completely irrelevant for single travellers like me, but a big deal for larger travelling parties and one of the Q Suite's major differentiators. Shortly after takeoff, my beverage was delivered, an old fashioned to get the flight rolling, alongside some warm nuts. Qatar has a dine on demand strategy, meaning you can eat when you want, which ties in nicely with the early taking of orders to ensure your choice of dish is reserved for you. As we passed the UFO landing pads in Nevada, 
I remembered that my experience of Qatar has been that they will feed you to a traditional timetable unless you rebel quite proactively. And this flight was no exception, although as it was close to 5pm LA time by the time the dinner service started, the cruise timetable was fine with me. The table wasn't explicitly laid, the starter was delivered on a tray and it was left up to you to arrange the components in an attractive way. The candle is a really nice touch. I am an experienced enough diner to be able to work out the correct knife and fork without supervision. I went for the veal as a starter. I love the Arabic meze offered on flights out of Doha, but the American tapas option didn't have quite the same appeal. The veal was an ambitious dish with some hefty chunks of truffle mixed in. Great if you like truffle, but I find it a little overpowering, but it was a signal that Qatar takes its meals seriously on flights like this. Oil and balsamic vinegar to accompany the bread, although the bread itself wasn't brilliant or oddly soggy at one end. My main option was the lamb shoulder with parmesan mousseline, basically a richer, cheesier type of hollandaise sauce. Very tasty, but my word it was rich. Not sure I'd order that particular dish again, but you cannot deny the ambition. Accompanied by a McLaren Vale Shiraz, which was excellent. I did notice that the wine list was an ultra long haul version, which is a little more elaborate than the regular business class wine menu I received on my flight back to London. I'll share the menus at the end of the video. The desserts looked great on the menu, but I don't have a particularly sweet tooth, so opted for the cheese. And if Oliver Butterfield is still subscribed, I was able to finish the plate on this occasion. Accompanied by an absolutely superb 20 year old port. After dinner, it was time for some plane spotting. Very unusual to see three other planes in such quick succession. Time to change into the gym jams. Even though you have privacy in your seat with the door closed, it's apparently poor etiquette to get naked at your seat, so I changed in the loo. I am available for modelling engagements if anyone wants to reach out. Quite a nice loo, a few value added bits like the wood effect housing, but the biggest value add comes from having a window. I converted the seat into bed mode, which is a quick and smooth process. A turndown service was available, although I did it myself. I realised later that the DIY approach meant I missed out on the mattress topper, which the crew has access to. I found the seat to be very comfortable even without this. My feet did bounce around the foot cubby a little, and some of the housings do intrude a little, but it was long enough for my 6 foot 4 inch frame, and you can turn the light off to sleep. Decent width of the shoulder, and it doesn't feel claustrophobic around the head. You are inclined to compare the Q-Suite to a first class product, but it is a business class seat, and even with the Q-Suite frills, the economies of business class cabins means you get about the same space as you do on other airlines, which inevitably means there's a foot cubby, and not quite as much space as you'd like. I started watching a film, but felt it was time to get some sleep. Given the time of year and the northerly routing of the flight, it never really did get dark outside. About four or five hours later, I woke to see that the cabin lights were on and there was some activity in the aisles. A bit confusing as there was no need to be disturbing people, but a few moments later the captain announced that there was a medical emergency on board which required us to divert back to Reykjavik. It took close to another hour to actually land, which does make me wonder why we doubled all the way back to Iceland. The runways in the Faroes are far too small to accommodate us, but I don't think it would have taken much longer to push on, perhaps to Edinburgh, which, in addition to saving us a couple of hours of travel time in getting to Doha, has the added advantage of being a port served by Qatar. But the rationale for the flight plan wasn't explained, indeed the communication overall was really poor. Iceland though is spectacular, and we landed and taxied to a service area of the airport well away from the terminals. An Ambu lift swiftly arrived to remove the passenger and their family, but no one else was allowed off. The captain said we'd be back in the air in an hour. After an hour and 10 minutes, we were told it would be another 20 minutes. 30 minutes later, and it was five or 10 more minutes, and we finally took off about two and a quarter hours after landing. 
No explanation was provided for what was going on, although the tail camera did show that quite a number of containers were removed from the plane, which I thought was very odd, although it looked like they were all loaded back on again before we could go. The only thing I can think of is that there was livestock in them which needed to be attended to. Any ideas? Leave me a comment below if you have a theory as to what was going on there. There was a limited service while we were on the ground, but the crew was absolutely great and I sensed that they were a little concerned about how things would pan out. But we finally took off for what was expected to be an eight hour leg down to Doha. We overflew the Faroes about five hours after we'd first reached them, turning my 16 hour marathon flight into a 21 hour ultra marathon. Taking into account the hours delay on boarding, it meant I ended up in the seat for almost 22 hours. I did say I wanted a decent chunk of time in the seat to really appreciate it, but I perhaps didn't want quite that long. And returning to the dearth of communication from the cockpit, lots of people were understandably anxious about connections, and I think the flight deck could have done a lot more to put people's minds at rest. We also heard nothing about the condition of the passenger we'd offloaded. The delay was annoying, but I'm sure everyone understood the need for the diversion and would have loved to know how the person was doing. Shortly after taking off, the crew decided it was time for breakfast. I stuck with the omelette, although once again it was enhanced with great globs of truffle that made it quite a tough eat, if I'm honest. Many may have loved it, but again, I found it really rich. I'd had enough rest before the diversion that I wasn't sleepy, and time did begin to drag a little. I watched a film, and then I watched another film, at the end of which there were still three hours to landing. The menu advertised light options, and by now it was a good five hours after breakfast, but the crew wasn't proactively offering more food, and given the delay, I got the sense that the galley was running a little low by the end of the flight. I fancied something fizzy to pick me up, so I had a beer, and yet more warm nuts. And then finally, we descended into Doha and landed. And 21 hours and 40 minutes after boarding, I deboarded. So conclusions, Qatar's Q Suites are great, and I spent close to an entire day on them on this trip. Despite that, I was never uncomfortable in the seat, I was never hungry, and although I did get a bit bored, I was always able to find some entertainment to distract me. And I actually felt pretty good when I got off the plane, and I can't imagine feeling that good having travelled in any other business class seat. The biggest array of people holding destination signs that I've ever seen. I'd overheard that 99% of passengers were connecting, and with such a delay, that had become a major operation. Another dozen or so signs were held out at the top of the escalator. 21 hours and 40 minutes. <laughs> Back to the summary. The food was good, but I think Qatar was trying a little too hard with the menu, and I perhaps made some bad choices. The drink was outstanding. The crew was also excellent. Qatar's crews can be a little timid and standoffish, and they actually were on my later flight, but I think these ultra-long haul routes are staffed with Qatar's very best crew, and I really enjoyed the service experience and the chats I had with them. And the seat really is great. Is it the best business class seat in the world? Probably. In fact, almost certainly. Particularly if you're travelling as a family. You can't conclude that for sure until you've flown on every business class cabin offered, but I've not flown in a better seat. Is it the perfect business class seat? Probably not. I think there are some small opportunities for improvement within the Q-suite as it currently stands. Specifically, a higher wall would increase privacy. The tray could fully retract to remove the sense of cramping around the knees, and a secondary storage nook could be added to hold glasses and hearing aids when you sleep. So there are opportunities for creating a better seat than the current Q-suite, and any business class seat that does away with the foot cubby would instantly be competing to take the crown. So how much did I pay for this wonderful experience? If you bought this flight as a one-way trip in business class, you'd pay around £8,000 for the pleasure, which is around $9,500 and €9,500 at time of recording. But you'd be a bit mad to do so. 
Qatar recently adopted avios as its frequent flyer currency, so I was able to buy flights from Los Angeles to London via Doha for only 90,000 avios plus taxes and fees of £154. Availability is not exactly abundant at that price, but it can be found, and I talk a little about how to find seats in that Qatar video. So if you value an avio at 0.8 of a P, which is their value when spent in Sainsbury's, and apportion the cost across the two flights based on the miles flown, the flight cost me £628. That's £40 per scheduled hour of flying time for the best business class seat in the sky. So thanks for watching a long video today, but it was by far the longest flight I've ever taken in the most complex product you can experience on an aircraft. So hopefully I've taken up your time productively. Please leave this video a like if you enjoyed it. Leave me a comment. Have you travelled on the Q Suite? Would you be excited to having watched this? If you're new to the channel, please subscribe. And if you'd like to support what I do here more directly, I have a Patreon account, the link to which you can find in the description below. So I'll leave you with the menus, and I hope you enjoyed the video, and I'll see you all again soon in the next one. Goodbye.